Good uh, morning. I hope you uh, enjoyed uh, the sessions on Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, and uh, India. It, uh, for me, is also always remarkable how these places also lead when it comes to the digital agenda. Over the next two hours, I'm going to take you under the hood of the end-to-end -end digitalization of Unilever. This is a gross and margin expansion story. And I believe when we play it well, when we execute fast and at scale, it can also help us to build new advantage. First, a small video. Three minutes away. Give me your number, Elijah. What's happening? You know that? Okay, it's cool. Alexa. Tomorrow, instead of Christmas Day being devoted just to family, a record number of people are expected to be shopping online. Our future uh, is already here. You know the future. Uh, when we engage with brands in the digital space, we expect these brands to know us. What's real convenience when you get goods delivered in 30 minutes or at least two hours? Already happening. Brands, products, experiencing experiences are merging. Ice cream now, is that a product? Is that a surface? It's all melting. And then last but not least, agile is the norm. You don't need to be completely integrated anymore to be in consumer goods. The thing you need to be is fast. Basically, there is an abundance of digital signals in our ecosystem, whether it's consumer data, whether it's customer data, internal operations data, uh, sensors in our factories, and obviously a lot of external data sources. Not really new. What is really, really new is what we can do with it. We can now store all these data 
affordably in the cloud and have the processing capacity, which we never had before, to combine all these different data sets to draw new insights. Why do I believe that this is actually a really good thing for Unilever? Why does it play to the advantage of Unilever? Firstly, multi -cat being multi-category is actually a good thing because you pick up richer data sets on both consumers, citizens, and customers. Multi-local, multi-global. Uh, you saw how the C4G organization work. Obviously, technology and data love scale, but you need to be able to action those insights quickly, whether that's on a global level, but very often at the local level. Multi-business model. Unilever already operates and is comfortable with operating many different business models. When you talk innovation nowadays, it's not the new variant. Yes, that also happened. But it is often business model innovation. And Unilever is comfortable with running different business models. Jane will talk a little bit about our technology platforms and partnerships. Over the last year, we have done an amazing job building what I believe is true advantage in this area. And then last but not least, scale. Big data is called big data because all these AI tools, they need large quantity of data to make them robust, and we have them. So it's not that we never did digital because we have been talking and doing digital for the last 10 years. But often it was in pockets. It was experiments. And last year we decided to scale in a very structured way across all countries. You know, every company will give you examples of good digital activities somewhere. We believe that we can make this a reality in all categories, in all divisions, in all functions, and in all the countries where we operate, whether that is Bangladesh or Myanmar or the US or in China. And ultimately, what the technology allows us to do is become truly consumer and customer centric. We can build models around individual consumers and find their friction points, their hopes, their aspiration, and then serve them with the solutions that will make their life better or that help them to make sustainable living commonplace. Same for customers. In the past, and you saw that during the presentations today, we would basically engage with many retailers, millions of retailers, through distributors. Technology now allows us to have a direct relationship with these customers. And indeed, this will enable us to serve them better. And then, when you think a little bit broader, you can see this world of consumer data and this world of customer data merging. It's not too hard to imagine that when we create uh, a male shampoo for people with gray hair, you know, I'm looking at you now, uh, who uh, want to have black hair, that we target this directly to the people who have gray hair. But you can also imagine that at the end of the digital ad, there's a coupon that sends the same consumer to a retail store next door. And this ability to drive true commerce throughout our consumer and customer networks, I think, is really unique and a huge growth driver over the coming years. But it is not only about growth. When we look at the end-to-end -end digitalization of the company, we basically go cross functions. Starting with the supply chain, you already heard the concept of creating digital twins of factories, robotics, robotic pro uh, process automation. So an enormous amount of opportunity to make our product supply uh, systems a lot more effective. Or 
customer development. You saw a couple of examples today in the India and the Pakistan sessions. How can technology transform not only how we take orders, how, how we drive consumption with the consumers who come to our uh, customers, but also how do we deliver our products. The customer development function will be truly changed over the coming years. In the consumer space, we do a lot of work on data-led marketing, and you will hear more of that by Stan uh, later. But think about inside mining. You know, how often have we discussed, you know, you have all these agile competitors, they do stuff, and how quickly can we react? But we have the ability now to see what everybody is doing real time, whether large or small, massively impacting the way we can do uh, marketing. Inside mining, I already mentioned uh, this around innovation. It's great when you can see that a trend is happening, but do you have the systems to react quickly on those trends? Can you come in the market faster than your competition? Can you <laughs> react when a, comp a competitor is doing something interesting? Can you react within two or three uh, weeks? And then last not, but not least, how can you digitize operations? We have a lot of manual operations in our business yet that are there to be digitized. Uh, a, a short uh, sample is our sales and operation planning process. Currently, there are millions of hours getting spent on planning how much will we sell by the salespeople, by the marketeers, by the uh, factory planners, and then trying to create a demand forecast. Now, technology allows us to automate processes like that and make it completely hands-free. This will require a new way of working. It will partly require new talent. And this part of organization and culture is essential. The digital transformation of Unilever is 70% about people, culture, ways of working, and only 30% about the technology. It's all about change management. Good, what will we do over the next two hours? We basically will focus on consumer and insights and marketing, on innovation, on the route to market, of which you already saw a couple of uh, examples uh, this morning, and Lina will take us through what this now really means for talent. Stan, I think you're next. Thank you. Great. There's still two minutes to noon, so I can still wish you all good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about data-driven marketing and what are we doing in Unilever in that space. So that's me. Uh, and in the wheel that uh, Peter showed, there was this one component which talked about data-driven marketing, and that's what is going to be the focus of the session. But let me put this in context. There are 2.5 billion people who are using our product on a daily basis. It's 2.5 billion. It is unprecedented scale. That's like a third of the world's population, a little over a third of the world's population touches one of Unilever products on a daily basis. Now, when you look at a number like that, the first thought that crosses your mind is, yes, we have a relationship with them, but that is in the physical world. How can we actually translate that into a relationship where we can actually communicate with them besides them experiencing our product? And that would be the holy grail, and that's what we are trying to go after. Now, around this time, uh, around this time when we actually built this phenomenal uh, 2.5 billion daily usage uh, business, the world of marketing is actually undergoing a fairly big transformation. It is actually it is moving from a world of mass marketing to a world where mass customization is happening. And this is something that is happening in a lot of countries around the world. It's not a new idea, but what we foresee is a world where hyper-personalization is going to happen. And when hyper-personalization happens, 
you need a totally different set of muscles, you need a totally different set of skills to actually make this dream come true. And hyper-personalization is actually being driven by the rapid explosion of the whole digital media. So that's the journey that we are on, mass marketing to mass customization to hyper-personalization. That's what we are trying to do. Now, some of you might have been there in Inglewood Cliffs in the US last time when we had the investor presentation. And in that presentation, I talked about our ambition and vision of getting to one billion one-to-one -one relationship with uh, consumers by 2019. Now, that was a year ago. And at that point of time, we had 200 million records in our uh, database. But what we have achieved right now, in little over a year, we have close to uh, 900 million uh, comparable number, number comparable to the 200 million that we have. And we are very confident that we will get to a billion by end of the year. Now, that's a full year ahead of time. And therefore, our vision of having one billion one-to-one -one relationship is actually becoming a reality right now. Now, the big question is, okay, fine, you have one billion uh, people in your records. What do you do with that? And that's what data-driven marketing is all about. So let me try and explain data-driven marketing in plain, simple English. It's all about capturing data of consumers, analyzing them in a way in which we can make sense out of the data and actually use that for talking to consumers in a more meaningful and relevant way, and then leverage the data at scale to have an ongoing conversation. And why do we want to do that? We want to do all that to do precision marketing, performance marketing, and one-to-one -one marketing. Now, you might wonder what those three types of marketing are all about, and I'll give you a very brief explanation of what each of those three things mean. Precision marketing is all around how do I target somebody based on their own needs, and can I find cohorts of people who have similar needs? In good old days of marketing, we used to focus on two or three segments, and I think those days are pretty much gone. You need to create multiple segments so that you can actually target them with the right content so that you have a better relationship because you're talking to them in a meaningful way. Performance marketing is all around translating that into uh, some form of commerce. And how do we actually do that? Whether we send them to a retailer or whether we send them to an e-commerce site, that's fine. But then it's all about how do I drive a relationship into performance marketing? And then the last one is one-to-one -one marketing, and that's the holy grail, and we are on our way to getting to that place. Now, we have a very simple uh, architecture for making this come alive, and this is powered by technology, and you know, this is in partnership with Jane and her team at in ETS. And this is all about, you know, there are two types of data. There are device IDs, and there are personal identifiable information, and there are two different sets of IDs. Now, you might be sitting there and wondering, you're collecting all this data, you know, are you, is it privacy compliant and so on? I'll address that a little later in my presentation, so suspend uh, your thought on that process. So we collect device IDs and personal identifiable information data, and they, because they, by nature, they're two different types of data, you need to store them in, in a very, very different way. And in the device ID data goes into what we call as a DMP, which is then used to actually uh, leverage uh, and do a whole range of communication. Personal identifiable information is actually stored in what is called as a consumer profile store, but these two do talk to each other because they are constantly enriching each other. So that is very simply put what uh, we do from a technology standpoint uh, to actually capture, analyze, and leverage the information that we're capturing. Now I want to play a video which talks about why we actually need, need to do data-driven marketing. Can you play the first video, please? <coughs> Young parents are going through the biggest change of their lives. Everything is new and they want to be sure their baby gets the best care possible. Although they have a similar daily routine, every parent is different and each have their own habits and ways of expressing themselves. Meet Denise, Doroshi and Matthew. Unilever wants to be with them in this special moment of their life, providing valuable support and advice. But that's not always easy which is why we need to engage and capture data accordingly. 
Denise engaged with the brand and in this case accepted an invitation to share her story on her favourite social media platform. But Deroshi and Matthew didn't notice our campaign and continued their normal routine. In the past, Denise registered on the site providing her PII data to receive news and updates. Her data is now stored on the Unilever cloud, meaning we can send her personalised content. There are more parents like Denise, therefore we are able to create a segment. We call them the hands-on parents. Our social business analytics capabilities also help us to leverage their online presence and get to know them better through their interests and influences. Our next media campaign will be even more tailored to this segment by using creatives which resonate with them. But how can we collect Deroshi and Matthew's data? They both have different interests and didn't engage with the brand in the first place. When Deroshi visited sites related to organic and natural, we were able to leverage third-party data from our partners. As a result, we can recognise her passion points and use this for better targeted campaigns in the future. She can also become our first party data, in this case by connecting with our consumer engagement centres and allowing us to collect her PII data. In the meantime, Matthew went to a local supermarket and used his loyalty card. We used second party data to establish he is the value with confidence hunter. Using our data sharing partnerships with retailers, the next time he is close to his local store, we geofence him and send a targeted basket value campaign. As a result, he buys our product. This story of three parents shows us that in a data-rich world, hyper-segmentation is possible. It requires a combination of first, second and third-party data. Leveraging power of mobile and digital, we now have the ability to target people with tailored messages, and we have capabilities to do so. UStudio to create hyper-segmented content, tech such as Adobe and Ultra, to deliver content in a segmented way. Parents are not just parents. They're all different and we need to make them feel special and loved if we want them to love our brands. That's the power of DDM. Great, so when we, you know, this is not just a, a nice little video which brings a concept to life. Yes, it does that, but beyond that, when we actually execute it in the marketplace, it actually gives us incredible results. And we have seen that. I don't want to spend too much time, but you know, whether it is from a media efficiency standpoint or whether it is in terms of you know, what we have been able to do in terms of one-to-one -one communication and how we improve the brand attitudes and the extent to which we have been able to drive commerce, all of which is actually doing very well when we actually do data-driven marketing. Now, what I want to do is, instead of talking conceptually about this and you know, giving a few random examples, I want to present some case studies from countries where they have deployed it at scale. The first one is from Thailand. And let me, uh, can you play the first video, please? Second video, sorry. where all household buy Unilever product yet we have been knowing nothing about them for so many years so we embrace on the journeys of understanding and personally engage with the consumers as we speak we have more than 14 million Yay! consumers data personally identifiable captures in our database already and we are enriching this with our PRM journeys PRM initiative adding and enriching all the data with every interaction that consumers made in our digital assets Right now, we've targeted over 240 consumer segments already in our media communication plan, making our plan smarter, sharper, and most importantly, so relevant to consumers every time we connect with them. So, I talked about precision marketing. In a place like Thailand, 100% of the digital spend is driven through precision marketing approach. And that's quite incredible. And all this happened at a fantastic pace. 
Just a year ago, the leadership of Thailand actually leaned in on this whole idea, and they started uh, executing data-driven marketing. And you can see the speed at which the growth happened. And all that I want you all to do is to focus on the 37 million number right at the right extreme. We have 37 million personal identifiable information in Thailand with consumer consent and approval to engage with them. That is roughly half the population of Thailand. And it is probably around 70% of the entire netizen population in Thailand. And that is scale for you. That is scale for you. And all this happened in less than one year. And this is thanks to a very good strategic partnership that we have with a company called Line in Thailand. And that's how we were able to actually accelerate this in a very big way. The next case that I want to uh, showcase is from India. Now, you saw some uh, data-driven marketing examples from India yesterday, but this is a different one from India. This is around baby Dow. Can you play the third video, please? Today, we are going to talk about India's story on present marketing at scale. The operating word being scale, as that is key especially for consumer goods industry. What we mean by present marketing is the right message at the right time in the right place to the right person. The blueprint of our present marketing approach in India is you start with capturing intent, curating brand persona, and then customizing brand experience. And the design has rapidly helped us acquire consumer data on our cloud technology, which we call Unilever Cloud. Why you should be interested in the rest of presentation? Because this approach delivers two times ad awareness uplifts at no extra cost. And we see this on YouTube, where the sharply targeted audience outperforms general population on both engagement as well as efficiency metrics. And the story is no different for Facebook. Let me illustrate how this works through a live example. This is on Baby Dove. We started by capturing intent through lookalike audiences that we created on the household panel which in India is IMRP and houses that use baby products. And based on these seed audiences, we further created lookalike audiences on Facebook. How did we get this intent? Through a partner called Shoplist that allowed us to capture intent and consumer persona. From this baby dub seed audience on Facebook, we created a lookalike audience that was much larger than the seed audience we had when we started off. And to these consumers, we served a Facebook creative that was designed for the Facebook environment and the news feed. Similarly, we deployed audiences on YouTube. The results have been tremendous. In the period before deployment, we were spending around half a million euro monthly for TV and digital plans. Post deployment, we moved to a quarter of that cost at 100,000 euro and substantive uplift on all three brand matrices including awareness and key brand measures like moisturizes better and mileage gentle for skin. Clearly, this is a big proof point for us that lookalike audiences created around first party data is truly a force multiplier for our media plans. And with Unilever Cloud, it makes possible to leverage technology massively to build more and more business cases and returns on our media investments. Thank you so much. Now, you can do a lot of these things with second party data as well, but we have chosen to go down the route of first party data because we think that will create a competitive edge. Otherwise, if you're going to be using the second party data, you need to buy the audience again and again and again. And every time you buy, it becomes an expensive proposition, and then your ROIs actually come down quite significantly, And which is the reason why we said it is worthwhile being patient, build your own first party data, make it richer with second and third party data, and you can be off to the races. And as you know, we have a billion first party data, and we have pretty good scale. So how do we make all this happen within Unilever? So what are the key critical success factors for data-driven marketing? We have learned a lot over the last one year, and I don't think the learning would ever stop, because every day you come across one new surprise or the other. It's an ongoing journey. But the one foundational thing that is non-negotiable within Unilever is GDPR compliance. And let me explain that. This is not GDPR compliance only in Europe. We are using GDPR standards in whichever country 
we are deploying data-driven marketing. It could be a country that has got a little bit more lax legislation, but we would still deploy GDPR compliant because we are Unilever, we operate globally, and we want to have the highest possible standards. So that's uh, GDPR. Once the foundation is set up, then we have a bunch of things called digital mandatories. Based on all the digital work that we have done over the last few years, we have a set of 20 things that you need to do. If you do that, you make the chances of success quite good. And this is almost like a checklist that everybody can look at it and say, am I compliant with the digital mandatories or not? And that is something that we have rolled out at scale throughout the whole marketing community. The deployment of technology is actually not as easy because it is, you know, when we are talking about the scale of Unilever, it becomes actually quite complex. And especially it has got multiple stakeholders that we need to involve, whether it is, you know, Adobe or Microsoft or Sapient and so on. So what we've done is we've created a new ways of working through a process called Glassmail, and that helps us to leverage technology and scale it in, in terms of deployment. U-Studio, you can have a fantastic data-driven marketing technology platform, but if you cannot create customized content, the game is over, And which is the reason why we have U-Studio. And you can create great content, but if you don't know how to deploy it, then again, the game is over, So, which is why we have Ultra, which is probably the industry leading practice in terms of programmatic buying. And we have been buying without having our brands appear in uh, dangerous websites uh, around the world. So it's a really industry leading practice that we have. Now, GDPR compliance, it is a journey. It has been a journey. You know, we started off with, when we did an audit, we, are, we had a long way to go. But we've put a lot of energy and people behind GDPR to make sure that we become GDPR compliant, and the countries are given a silver, bronze, silver, or gold. And all our big countries are now on gold certification. But we don't think we should stop there. Gold is good, but compliance is only part of the game. But how do you become excellent in terms of how you use that data sensitively and uh, in a way in which you respect the privacy of person? And that's what we are moving on to, from gold standard to platinum, diamond standard is what we are going after. Then the digital hub, this is probably one big game-changing thing that we have deployed. Digital hub is a new way in which you bring data-driven marketing to life. It is actually literally a physical table consisting of people sitting around it and working in real time so that they can make changes as they go along. So essentially, I don't want to go through all the kind of job description that you need, and, uh, you need to make dig digital hub come alive. But it essentially consists of people who know how to create audiences. You know, you have data, you have traits of consumers, but then you need to segment them. You know, the Thailand example, they talked about 240 different segments. But how do you create the 240 segments at scale and then find out who those people are? How do I scale that implementation throughout the country? So there's a bunch of, you know, uh, high-end analysts who actually do that kind of work. And then there's always a data governance person to make sure that, you know, you're not, you know, going off rail. Uh, and then content creation and audience activation, and then finally there is an e-commerce or performance marketing expert. So it's an end-to-end -end team. That's what brings Digital Hub to life. Now this ways of working is mission critical for bringing data-driven marketing to life. Now where are we in terms of deploying Digital Hub? In 2018, we have deployed Digital Hubs in 11 countries around the world. And these are some of the usual suspects, the big countries. We have deployed it in 11 countries. And that's pretty good speed. And I think if I look back, it probably started somewhere in April of this year. And in under nine months, we have actually deployed it in 11 countries. Think about tech stack, data acquisition strategy, creating the whole environment for us to actually make it happen. All that got done in nine months, and we are in 11 countries. By 2019, 2020, we will deploy it in 24 countries. But as Peter said, we can't be happy with 24. 24. It needs to be available in every single country around the world. So by 2021, our goal is to get it to the whole world because we believe that this data-driven marketing is the way it's going to happen. I want to give you a quick feel of how the digital hubs look like. You know, this is you know, the digital hub in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, that's where it actually started. That's where it actually started. And then subsequently, it got uh, rolled, uh, rolled into uh, Southeast Asia and other markets. And Peter drove that very aggressively in all the Southeast Asia countries, Thailand, 
Indonesia, Philippines, and so on. And then it's got rolled into other countries. So this is just to give you an idea of how it looks. This is a digital hub in uh, our office in our business in UK, which is in Leatherhead. Sorry, this is the Leatherhead one. So in summary, what I would say is that these things cannot happen if you don't have the right skills. You need to have the right people to do this kind of things. So what we are doing is we are actually leveraging a lot of talent that we have internally and skill them up so that those people can be the best digital marketers that they are capable of. But that is not enough. That is not enough. We also need to invest disproportionately higher in terms of building digital capability, whether it is a connected world training program or whether it is you know, making people go through experiential trainings in, by work, making them work in digital hubs. We do that. So enhance the skills of people. And also, we are also realistic about the fact that we need to augment people. We need to get new people to come and work in the uh, digital P uh, hub so that we, they can bring outside in thinking. And the combination of these three things is the one that will, we strongly believe is going to accelerate our journey well and truly. And it is already underway right now. And in fact, over 1,250 digital marketers are already there in the company right now. And Lena will talk about that in her session. And that's what we are doing. So with that, I'll say thank you so much. And I'll hand over to uh, Abby, who's going to talk about agile innovation. Thank you, Sam. Morning. In the mid-1870s, the light bulb was invented, for the late 1870s. By the mid-1880s, the first electric motors were beginning to be used in manufacturing. And yet by 1900, only 5% of American manufacturing was running off electricity. The age of steam lingered. Think about what a steam-powered factory must have looked or felt like, a single massive steam engine outside, powering a single steel drive shaft running down through the middle of the factory. There were bit belts and gears, noisy machinery running pretty much all of the time, needing constant oiling. They were dirty, dangerous, and not very efficient. So why did it take factory owners so long to harness the power of the new technology that was electricity? And of those who did, why were they so slow to see the savings that they expected from it? Because to harness this new technology, you had to change. As a factory owner, you had to change the way that you worked. With electricity, you could bring power to individual people, individual workstations. You could organize around the logic of a production line rather than the logic of a steam engine. They could be clean and safe and airy and light. But you couldn't just harness this power by ripping out the steam engine and replacing it with an electric motor. You had to think about the whole architecture of your building. You had to think about your processes, your systems, and of course, the people who you hired, how you trained them. They had buttons. They could, they could harness the power themselves how you trained them, how you paid them, how you recruited them. Of course, change happened. By the mid-1920s, American manufacturing was flourishing as the industry worked out how to harness a technology that was nearly 50 years old. Roll on 100 years with the advent of computers. We saw similar patterns. You couldn't just rip out typewriters and replace them with computers. The companies who were able to harness, again, this new technology that was computers, had to rethink their whole business models, how they were organized, how they were, how they were structured. I think the, the parallels with new technologies today are again clear. If we just pull in the new technologies on top of our current ways of working, our current systems, our current processes, we've missed a trick. And the only way to really realize the full potential of technology, data, everything that, that's available to us now is to actually change the way that we work as well. We're well positioned to harness this, particularly bringing in agile innovation through the groundwork that we laid pretty much this time two years ago as we kicked off the Connected for Growth change program, particularly as you've heard many times through the CCBTs, our country category business teams, by encouraging them and enabling them to lead more innovation, locally led innovation closer to our consumers, closer to our customers. This year, we've been bringing in on top of that our Lean Like a Startup program, bringing in some of the tools, 
and the mindset of successful startups, not just because this is how startups work, but because this way of working is genuinely the best way to get real learnings from real consumers fast and get better mixes out into the market quicker. But of course, if, we, if we're going to change this and if we're going to embed these new ways of working sustainably and systemically, we also have to rewire our, or rewire our underlying systems and processes. So we're also in the process of doing a complete redesign of our innovation governance process, moving from a traditional linear stage gate process to one which is more agile, more iterative, and genuinely enables our teams, both our global and our local teams, to get better innovation to market faster. So all of this then combined with sh much sharper innovation strategies across all of our categories now, harnessing the data and the new technology that we have that you heard about through Stan, through the whole innovation process from data mining, building on the insights, to then crafting and developing and launching better mixes. Our most recent example of this you heard about briefly yesterday. We launched only three weeks ago in China. Purify is the first anti-pollution personal care brand in China. An example not only of a very relevant local insight developed with local consumers, but also an example of a brand that was launched using a lean and very much a data-led approach. Before I say more, let's just have a look at the video. This is Woman 它是PM 2.5 你能毫无顾虑，继续为你热爱的城市而奋斗。静春，战胜PM2.5的静斗士。This this is a brand that the team took from idea to launch in seven months. Our first brand co-created with Alibaba, genuinely harnessing all of their data and uh, data technology expertise. So using their data and their analytics capabilities working with us in-house to test every mix, every element of the mix, the proposition, the product, the price, the packaging. And this, way of, this way of testing and learning allows us to get much more accurate feedback from real consumers in a real shopping environment versus in an artificial survey environment. It allows us to test multiple features with multiple groups of consumers at the same time and of course, all of this in weeks rather than months. Using also the data, again, as we heard earlier on, to communicate the benefits of this product in different ways to different groups of consumers, whether they're outdoor sports lovers or health food buyers, sensitive skin consumers, or buyers of other anti-pollution products. And again, as we've seen in the examples from Thailand and elsewhere, even in the last three weeks, the sales uplift from these targeted groups is significantly outperforming our control groups. We're beginning to see the impact of these new agile, lean like a startup ways of working across all of our business, particularly building momentum this year. So before I go into another example, just a short video of some of the examples of the new products and brands that we've actually launched this year, so in the last seven or eight months. All of them worked on in a very, in very much in a, in a, lean, in a lean way, our internal founders. I have the second video, please.
of these, as you can see, and as we've heard over the last two days, are locally led innovations. But I think you can also see many of them with a genuine, potentially global insight in there. In the last two years, so since we launched C4G, we've doubled the number of locally led innovations, up more than 100%. And this is whilst at the same time maintaining the number of our global innovations and the size of those global innovations in market. Now, this is an acceleration which obviously won't, won't continue at this rate, but I think you can feel the momentum, particularly coming through the CCBTs, in the, the capacity that they now have, the capabilities that they now have, to genuinely launch more locally relevant innovation. And these local innovations, we've had the time that, that it takes us to get them to market. Again, many, all of, the, all of the, the things that you saw in the video were launched in less than a year, many of them in under six months. A final example, again, I touched, Alan touched on yesterday. It's worth going into a little bit more. We've heard about what they've achieved, but in terms of how they actually achieved this, again, this is a brand which you probably heard about this time last year, just as we were about to launch. So one year on, as of this month, we're in fact in 14 markets, four categories, 19 beauty awards, and as the team says, still counting, and nearly 60 million euros in turnover. This is a, a brand which is again brought to market from idea to launch in less than a year, worked on by a lean, empowered, cross-functional team, working in a lean like a startup way, very much a founder's mentality, agile, both in terms of mixed development and in terms of agile decision-making. It was co-created with our consumers, harnessing many of the new testing tools that Stam's team have developed, either internally or in partnership with, uh, with other companies, many of them startups. Also co-created with our customers, using harnessing, again, data and technology to build genuine storytelling content and through that, organic reach. And then, when we have a model that we believe is successful, then, as you can see, we now are able to begin to scale up quickly. So finally, before I hand over to Lena, uh, so what we're really trying to do here is harness the technology, the data that's available to us, bring in on top of that new lean like a startup ways of working, and really embed all of that by rewiring our underlying processes and systems across the business and across functions so we can genuinely get better mixes into markets faster. So with that, I hand over to Lena, our Chief HR Officer. You know, Peter set it up wonderfully when he said, people, culture, capability are the heart of this transformation. And in true Peter style, proceeded to give me five minutes on the agenda. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a couple of numbers which will hopefully convince you that the next five minutes deserve your full attention. 70% of digital transformations failed. McKinsey Global Digital Survey released two months ago. The top three reasons they fail. Number one, lack of change in culture and behaviors. Number two, lack of digital talent. Number three, not able to make the organization fluid and empowered. Top three reasons why digital transformations fail. And if McKinsey is not enough to convince you, let me give you a BCG number. Report released last month, 40 companies studied that have transformed digitally, successfully, and sustained high performance. 80% of them had explicitly called out culture change as the key pivot to driving digital transformation. So can't underline enough how important this piece is. So building capability has two dimensions to it. One is bringing digital talent into the company. And when I say digital talent, I'm using it as an umbrella expression for information technologists, data scientists, precision marketeers, system integrators, the whole set of people who get this new world better than us. So we have, like Stan said, about 1250 digital talent. You'll see the scale. I would expect to see in 18 to 24 months, 20% 20 of Unilever looking like digital talent. That means recruiting at pace 10,000 people in the next couple of years. So the good news is we are really attractive to digital talent. 
We're number one employer of choice in 44 out of 52 markets. We have 3.9 million followers on LinkedIn. We are the most followed FMCG by a long margin, and we are the third most followed company in the world. So we are highly attractive. And the beauty of the LinkedIn platform is that it gives us an understanding of how digital talent sees us. So there are 5 million people on LinkedIn who would qualify to be digital talent. 2.5 million of them follow us and follow Paul and are interested in everything we put out, and those are people we keep a relationship with. All the campaigns we run on LinkedIn, all the employer brand things we do, we keep an eye if these five million are continuously interested in us. And I'll show you in a minute a campaign we ran, which we had 30% of that audience follow us watching this campaign. So we are attractive to digital talent. We can get them in. Getting them in at pace is a challenge because the average of a time to get in a talent of this caliber is 10 days. From the time you spot them to the time you bring them into the company is 10 days. So it means rewiring the way we do recruitment, the way we bring in talent to do this at pace and speed. So let me just show you the campaign for a second, which was attractive to the people we want to be attractive to. Maybe have the video, please. Job titles, they're not a big deal these days. Not to us, anyway. Because we know that you're much more than just a few words. You've got spark, ambition, drive, passion. You want to feel proud of what you do and make others proud of you, too. You want to make a difference in the world and have real impact. Whether you're a human spark igniter or a green planet saver or developing your career as a disruptive digital leader, you know what you care about, and you put it first, because what matters most is what you do. We put labels on our products, not our people. So bring change, make an impact, and be inspired to be your best self. To us, you are more than your job title. This is about bringing in digital talent, but we have to equip the rest of us who are in the company to be able to lead for this change. So we call it raising the flow and raising the ceiling, both. So there's digital literacy for all, and 60,000 people are going through this training. We've invested in a learning platform called Degree that allows us to curate all material that exists externally, all TED Talks, Coursera, what have you, curate all internal material, and give it to every person in a personalized, curated, daily feed of what they need to learn. And we have 2.3 million pieces of content. On a daily basis, at least 2,000 pieces of digital content get consumed every day. So we know at the touch of a button who's learning, who's not. Hashtag, I learn every day. If you're not learning every day in today's world, 15 minutes, 20 minutes set aside, it's not gonna, if you're not going to be equipped to lead in this world. So that's one thing we keep an eye on. Equally, there's targeted deepening of skills for people who are the front end of this change. Our 5,000 marketeers, our 5,000 people in planning, our people in supply chain who are running digital factories and robotic process automation. So for that targeted set of people, we run special programs. Marketing, we've had the highly successful Connected World program where 85% of our marketeers have been through. It's pretty tough. You're assessed at every stage of the program. You've got to go through 53 modules, each of them not less than 45 minutes, and clear the quiz at the end of each of those modules to even have the license to operate in your job. So it's massive investment in training and upskilling for our people. And that brings me to culture. So capability is one part of the challenge and equation. The other. And I think the far more difficult piece is the piece around culture. A, a digital culture is about moving from rigid job descriptions to much more leading people through purpose, giving people intent and purpose and setting them free. It's much more about moving from hierarchies and truly moving decision making to people who can see the impact of the decision making. In our Connected for Growth program, we did set up category country business teams, the CCBTs, who are empowered to take many decisions on PNL in their markets. 
So it's moving from hierarchies to networks. We've set up brand communities, which are networks of people who work on these brands together and can ensure learning and sharing in, in real, real time. From controlling, and this is a hard one, to truly empower people needs a lot of leaders to let go. A lot of people who work very hard to reach higher levels of hierarchy. Now we turn and tell them, by the way, you've got to let go. You've got to let go a lot more. You've got to believe you don't know the answers and people who are in the action know the answers. So it's a massive change. And getting to experimentation, what Abby showed you, really working in a manner where we are learning, repeating, making mistakes, failing fast, scaling fast. How do we do that? And doing this at pace across the company. So to, to shift a culture, the two big ingredients we need is leadership role modeling. How leaders lead is critical to transform culture. And the next is engaged employees. On leadership, we're putting our top 3,000 people through standards of leadership training, where we're saying the new way of leaders. How do you lead in the 21st century? How do you lead with humility? How do you lead from a sense of purpose? How do you lead with resilience? Because you're going to fail far more than you succeed. We're putting all 3,000 of our senior leaders who lead teams through this. And we're also making them and helping them to understand what it means to lead an organization that's 52% millennials. So we have enough young people out there. We have enough digital natives out there. How do we really liberate them, give them the space and inspiration to do what they're better, better than us at doing? So we're investing in our leaders so they can role model the right, right behaviors. On engaged employees, we're really privileged to have 92% of our people proud and engaged and wanting to work for Unilever and think this is the greatest place. I mean, we're so delighted, grateful, privileged to have that. Now we're spending time working with our employees on their beliefs and convictions on this change, fostering their understanding, getting their conviction, and upskilling them at pace so that they act and behave in the right way. Because what is culture? It is the way we all act and behave. So giving them the tools, giving them the understanding, giving them the atmosphere, the culture, the environment where their leaders empower them, and they can truly lead for it. So that's really what I wanted to say on capability and culture. Do I believe we're putting people at the heart of the agenda? Absolutely. Do I believe that the focus on capability and culture is massive in this transformation? Fully believe. But what gives me the greatest confidence is that we have the humility to say we don't know the answers and the curiosity to go and learn it from wherever, whoever is doing it well. So that's really what I wanted to talk to you about, putting capability and people at the heart of the digital transformation. Over Thank you. Minutes. Almost five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely, uh, this is the first half of the session. We'll now have lunch, then we do a second part, and then we'll have uh, enough time for questions and answers.